This evening we begin a new series of discussions and our general subject is the orientation of Hermetic philosophy. In all of these courses we are attempting in every way possible to present the material without depriving the student of the right to arrive at certain conclusions of his own. In other words, where certain reasonable doubts exist, where conflict or contradiction is present, we will say so in order that we shall at least have solid ground as far as we can go. And in the case of the Hermetic philosophy, we cannot go as far as we wish that we could. In the first place, the entire origin of this field of thought is utterly obscure. All that we have is a group of definitely conflicting reports. But out of the conflict itself, and out of the very circumstances which surround the times and conditions associated with the beginning of the school, we gain some very useful and practical insight. So we will try to sketch the field first historically. It is generally assumed that the only material that we have relating to the general subject of Hermetic philosophy originates in the writings of the Antinicene father Clement of Alexandria. Clement's Alexandrinus includes in his work a considerable discussion of a system of Egyptian ritualistic, symbolical, magical metaphysics which was prevalent at his time. And he wrote with the perspective of the late first and early second century AD. Uh, Clement does not, however, actually approach the central problem, namely, who was Hermes. Thus we have to seek in other directions, not nearly as factual or as comprehensive. The standard texts of the present time do not have any general knowledge of how what is called the Corpus Hermeticum came into existence. The corpus is composed or made up of a series of writings attributed to a mysterious person called Hermes and often referred to either as Hermes Trismegistus or Mercurius Termaximus in the Latin form. Several efforts have been made to assume that this Hermes was the, was the Egyptian deity Thoth, T-H-O-T-H, long associated with the concept of wisdom and considered by many to have become intermixed with the Greek Hermes, particularly during the period of the Grecian pharaohs of Egypt. That is the dynasty of the Ptolemies, the dynasty immediately preceding the beginning of the Christian era. There is no evidence of certainty, however, that the Hermes of the Hermetic school was actually the Egyptian thought. This, however, brings a further matter. Thoth as a deity was worshipped in Egypt for a very long time. It would be safe to say 
at least for 3,000 years before the beginning of the Christian era. The question naturally arises then, was this deity a deified human being? Did a being or creature by the name of Thoth actually exist at some remote age? The tendency now has been to suggest or suspect that many so-called deities were originally persons, and that through long periods of veneration and infallibility, a kind of deification was given to them by popular esteem. Plato declares that there were at least five persons by the name of Hermes in the Greek system. Therefore, that somewhere along the descent of this name, it was bestowed upon persons. Now, two possibilities present themselves under this thinking. The first is that the original concept of Thoth as one of the five elder deities of Egypt was that he was a god. And like Osiris, was originally a, a divine being, the basis of a general worship, at least in certain provinces and areas of Egypt. That later, this name was bestowed upon certain human beings as a title of honor or distinction. They were given names to indicate that they were so like or Hermes-like. Also, there is something to recommend the idea uh, that early writers, recognizing Hermes as the deity of universal mind, took the position that mind is the author of all works, therefore that behind the human author of every product is the universal mind who might well, therefore, be regarded as the genuine compiler, writer, or editor of the work. Thus a work could be dedicated to the universal mind as its true author. Thus persons in many ages could attribute their own productions, particularly those of vision and inspiration, to a deity long honored and regarded. It might then well occur that as in other religions and in other systems, both inspired teachers were said to have arisen, becoming the embodiments or incarnations of the principle of wisdom, therefore entitled to bear this name. Certainly there were several persons by the name of Orpheus, as Taylor points out for us, in his analysis of the mystical hymns of Orpheus. There was certainly more than one person in the course of time known as Zoroaster or Zarathustra. And it is quite possible that the last of the Zoroasters, who is said to have been personally known by Pythagoras, was by no means the first of these fire prophets, but was a distinguished philosopher or mystic or illuminata who had received this name as an honorary title. Thus it is quite conceivable that the name of Thoth or Hermes, because of the peculiar sphere of influence over which this deity was said to rule, could well have been associated with human beings whereas many other deities might not so readily adapt themselves to this process of humanization or this process of perpetual or periodic re-embodiment. We then have another thought which is rather daring, has not perhaps received too much consideration, but might be worth a second uh, glance. Namely, that Hermes, or both Hermes, the final 
person with whom we are concerned was actually a ritualistic personification. In other words, that this so-called person was the symbolic impersonation of an idea, and that with the gradual passing of time, this person became real, although no one seemed to know where he came from, who he was, of how he departed from this life. If he was a person in a sacred drama, a character in ritualism, a hero signifying universal mind, or even human mind, in its noblest and broadest sense, this person could become identified with a story. Ritualism could create a life for him create situations, but these situations would be essentially symbolical rather than literal, although they might be very well set forth in a rather literal appearing relationship. That such may have been the case in the situation involving Hermes is not unreasonable, for we know that even Clement refers to the Hermetic system as broadly and deeply ritualistic. Wherever ritualism becomes important, we have this tendency for the emergence of a prominent or principal ritual personality who becomes the actual embodiment of the doctrine, the procedure, and all that has to do with a system of religious philosophy or mysticism. We know also that it is quite possible for imaginary or ritualistic persons to gradually gain historical definition. A good example, of course, is the story of the Count of Monte Cristo, who had no existence except in the fertile imagination of Alexander Dumas, the father. Yet even today, tourists are taken out to the prison where he was imprisoned and his cell is carefully and faithfully shown to them. The fact that he never existed is of no particular importance anymore. Now there have been a number of instances in which uh, imaginary persons have so taken the public fancy that we prefer to accept them as factual. Now this is on a secular level. If we add to this the aura of divinity, creating a mystery and framing within this mystery a transcendent being, there is every reason to assume that it might be perpetuated as an historical person. So we have, in summary, about three broad possibilities here. One that we are dealing with a divinity representing a universal state of consciousness and that this divinity simply descended into the Greek period of Egyptian philosophy and was regarded as the patron of a school or system. The second is that this divinity was represented by embodiments and that therefore priestly initiates, teachers, authors, and scribes may have received this name and have therefore been regarded as this person. And the third, that he is a ritual figure, as we will find in many other uh, religions and philosophical systems. With this situation, as broadly expressed as we can, <laughs> We then come to the intricate problem of dating the Hermetic philosophy. Nearly always we must date a subject, particularly an unknown work, by context, by a study of the structure, by a study of the internal ideas presented. There, it is nice to assume that ideas can be born out of time, or that they can appear full-born and full-grown like Minerva from the head of Zeus. Uh, 
But actually, this is very rarely, if ever, the case. Every idea of man is set into a framework of time and place. The average person, and even the average highly informed person, cannot be totally unhistorical. He cannot have attitudes that are totally unknown to the world in which he lives, nor can he develop an idiom or a form of expressing himself that is completely outside of the language structure of his own time. Thus, through idiom, through structure, and through various colloquialisms, forms in grammar, and other instruments, it is nearly always possible to historically establish a work within a very few years. Uh, an example of this, of course, a good example, is the early Rosicrucian manifestos. The Fama and uh, Confessio Fraternitatis and the Chemical Marriage of Christian Rosenkreutz, these books are supposed to have been written much earlier than their date of publication. Actually, however, by studying them, we do discover that no matter when they were written or how they were written, they could not have been written before the rise of Martin Luther, because there are certain ideas incorporated into them in certain patterns which did not exist or were not known before that date. Thus, the earlier dating must be regarded as largely mythological. Now, in the study of the Hermetic writings, as they are preserved for us, we are in the presence of certain elements or factors that cannot be denied. The first is that they do not represent the philosophy of the ancient Egyptian. They are not a bona fide uh, perpetuation of the ancient uh, ammonistic doctrine of the principal Egyptian systems. They are not grounded or set in the Osirian cycle or the great restoration of Egyptian religion, nor can we clearly find them oriented into the temporary reforms of Akhenaten. That these teachings are not classical Egyptian, we must finally accept, because our gradually increasing knowledge of Egyptian literature and a number of recent discoveries on the dramatic and ritualistic and mystical writings of the Egyptians apart from their funereal texts, all these prove conclusively that the thoth of ancient Egypt is not actually the thoth Hermes of the Hermetic philosophy. We must come down to a more recent time in order to find the inspiration behind Hermeticism as we know it. There is every reason to assume from the text and the study that the works could not have been written earlier than the time of the rise of the golden age of Greek philosophy. Therefore, that the writings could not, in their surviving structure, be earlier than the 3rd or 4th century B.C. Also, there are other elements involved. Elements coming from the eastern side, indicating strong oriental influence. And this oriental influence is of a type which could not be any earlier than the golden period of Grecian thought, the so-called Age of Pericles. Therefore, assuming this to be the earliest possible date, and remembering always that the earliest known versions of these works are in Greek, we must uh, also determine, if possible, the latest conceivable date. And knowing the quotations from the Hermetic writings made by the Fathers in the first and second century, we can say with reasonable certainty that this work, the Corpus Hermeticum, must have been compiled or brought together in a period of approximately 300 years, not earlier than the middle of the 4th century B.C.
or later than the beginning of the Christian era. Uh, this uh, general pattern uh, will be subject to per perhaps a re-estimation of 40 or 50 years, but I think not more than that. Actually, the Corpus Hermeticum consists of 42 books, at least it is so traditionally stated. Against this is the rather bizarre background in which it is affirmed that the writings of, the, of Hermes originally included 10,000 volumes. Uh, this, I think, again, must cause us to pause and assume that probably uh, a symbolic meaning is intended. Here we have something to suggest Hermes as universal mind, the writer of all books. Even on this point, however, we must have a cautious attitude, because we know in listing the books of Plotinus, who came in a little later in North Africa, that the term book was not used then just as we use it today. It was used with a bit of the Soroyan quality, which was not so well known to antiquity, because some of the books of Plotinus do not contain over a thousand words. They're comparatively short tracts, but they are still called books. Uh, thus, we are not sure how much actual writing might be involved in the so-called mythological uh, library of the size mentioned. The next point is that the number 42, to refer to the so-called authentic works, is a highly significant number. It is the number of the Egyptian assessors of the dead, the jury that try the soul in the field of Amentet. It is also the number of the provinces of Egypt. There were 42 gnomes or provinces, and that is why there were uh, 42 assessors, one, uh, of each, one of the jurors being selected from each of the provinces or gnomes and their celestial correspondences in the universe. Thus the number 42 suggests high symbolism of some kind, and also reminds us that the phrenologists of the 19th century, for some reason quite unknown, decided that there were 42 faculties of the human brain. Again a number appearing which seems to exhaust certain intellectual processes and reflexes within the human intellectual equipment. So we have to be a little cautious on this point, the, uh, sensing the possibility that we are dealing with an allegory or a figurative concept of some kind, possibly even Kabbalistic. The next point in connection with it, of course, is that up to the present time, very few of the so-called original works of Hermes have been known. We will in a later discussion go into these books, but for our orientation problem, we might say that up to now 42 works are not known. The principal work that is known today is the Pyomandries, or the Shepherd of Men. Outside of that there are other short fragments but the Corpus Hermeticum contains nothing resembling 42 books. Early writers came to the conclusion that it never did. But now we must also pause for a, men a moment and mention the Kanaboskian find at Luxor in Egypt in 1946, when the discovery of a Gnostic library about 30 miles from Luxor also included within this collection of books several hermetic writings not previously known to exist. This opens the door for the speculation that it is possible that 42 works did exist at one time, that there was a reason for this selection, that it was not entirely arbitrary, or if it was arbitrary, it was a division set up within a group of writing in order to indicate some important sequence or symbolism involved in the work itself. Today, the term hermetic is perhaps more, more loosely used than any other in the field of philosophy.
we may say that after about the second or third century AD, this term became gradually the synonym of secret. Uh, anything that was completely sealed, completely hidden, uh, completely locked, was regarded as uh, hermetically contained in some way. And we still use the term to, si to signify a sealed vessel or retort. Actually, is as time went on, it uh, was used, the term was used, in connection with practically every system of unorthodox thinking that developed in the Mediterranean and European theaters from the 3rd century to the 17th. Now that is a long period of time. The word was thrown around and variously applied and misapplied for nearly 1400 years. During this time, it certainly wandered far afield. A very large literature involving it arose upon alchemical speculation. It even became involved in medicine and in astronomy and in mathematical formulas of one kind or another. It came in general to represent practically the whole body of a secret or profound learning particularly such learning as related to causes or to principles not immediately otherwise obvious or available. From this we must come to the conclusion that today it is exceedingly difficult to differentiate between the layers and overlayers of speculation which have developed around this theme. If we study the period most involved in the rise of Hermetic philosophy, say the period from the 3rd century B.C. down through and into the 1st century A.D., uh, this period certainly stands out as a period of extraordinary mental activity. It also stands out as the beginning of the rise of sectarianism as it had never previously been known. And we must pause for a moment to analyze this because I think it is important to us. Our ancient forebears in the North Africa the Mediterranean theater uh, usually had their own local religions. Uh, they had the religions of their provinces, and of their cities and communities. Usually the city or community faith was based of, upon that of the larger geographical area involved. When a nation conquered another nation, it conquered the gods along with mortals and brought its own religion which superseded that of the people that had been conquered. Thus there was very little actual a uh, change of faiths due to sectarianism. Uh, people were not inclined to say, I prefer to worship this way, and you can worship that way if it pleases you. You worshipped according to the land in which you lived. And if anything happened and your land changed proprietors, uh, then it was assumed that if your gods were not strong enough to preserve the country that they governed, then it was a good idea to change your gods and join up with the conquerors and at least be on the right side of the situation. And as changes in the religions of peoples were very slow and uh, most reformations were of slight general importance, I think we can say that up to the beginning of this critical period, there was almost no concept of what uh, the Shakespearean plays refer to as a misbeliever, an individual with a wrong religion. The only way you had a wrong religion was to be in the wrong place or to fail to change when some other religion took over your country. There were not minority faiths and majority faiths such as we know today. 
nor were there the 500 jarring sects referred to by Omar. These things simply had no existence. There was practically no tendency of anyone to say to another man, your faith is wrong or your gods are unreal or anything of that nature. That attitude was foreign to antiquity. Uh, wherever the deities were strong enough to protect you, you worshipped them. And generally, uh, the so-called state religion concept prevailed. And if you were within the state, you held to its faith. If you traveled from another country, temporarily as a merchant or someone of that nature, and you came within the area of a deity different from your own, it was assumed that there would be a certain fraternization among the gods also. Your belief was held with respect, but it was very unlikely that you would be able to convert anyone to it in the new area. Uh, uh, you were there as a guest. Your god was there as a guest of the local deities, and everybody expected everybody to take a nice attitude about the whole thing. All of a sudden, this changed, and changed in an extraordinary way. There gradually developed, in an incredibly short time, considering the motions of these days, a, a difference of attitude involving the re total rejection of certain ideas as false and superstitious, the imposing of an entirely new group of ideas, and the division of peoples into schismatic groups, bitterly uh, antagonistic to each other, and frequently ready to persecute and martyr the members of other faiths. This was a, a, a new and different situation. It arose uh, with the changing of certain patterns, and we still are not too sure of what caused these patterns to change. But individuals living quietly within the atmosphere of their local gods did not change without cause. And this cause was not revelational. This cause was historical, social, and political. It had to be, because it had to strike into the lives of many persons of different minds and in different localities, in whose lives and thoughts such ideas had not previously existed to a degree that there is any historical record of them. Something happened, and we must begin to try to find out what did happen. One of the things that probably contributed very strongly to this situation was the rise of the Roman Empire. The Romans were the first great colonizing people of our knowledge. Also, they were the outstanding exponents of a way of life based upon commerce, exchange, and economic uh, procedures. The Roman actually carried his religious philosophy more lightly than any other recorded ancient people. To him, religion was secondary to business. Of course, it's quite incredible that such a should be the case, and we can hardly imagine it, although we're in exactly the same spot today. Uh, the Roman uh, had his religious services, and he had his prayers, but he was perhaps the first man uh, to pray for the inconvenience of his competitors. <laughs> he very definitely invited the gods to work a hardship on anyone he didn't like. He also was perhaps among the first to pray for profit and for these material concerns which were comparatively secondary in the religious life of ancient peoples. He was also confronted with a situation that perhaps disillusioned him or on uh, another way of looking at it, opened him to the modern attitude on religion. In the process of colonizing and conquering and extending the boundaries of his domain until the Roman uh, in his glory 
controlled most of the known world. In this procedure, it was necessary for him to absorb, govern, direct, and integrate into the great pattern of the Roman uh, political structure more than a hundred different peoples. These peoples, each with their own religions. This was the first time that these various religions had been subjected to the domination of a comparatively unreligious people. Here we have an interesting situation because we can no longer assume that the gods of Rome simply won the battle. The Romans took much more faith in their phalanx and in their trained military power and in their machines of war than they did in divine intercession. The peoples conquered did not find it therefore possible to simply worship the gods of Rome. Even the Romans could not tell them how to do so. Other than state festivals and certain broad concepts, the Romans had no religious substitute uh, for the type of spiritual value which uh, existed among the peoples that were conquered. At no time, for example, did the Roman have a religious philosophy as deep as that of the British Druids, although he conquered Britain. He never had a religion or philosophy as great, noble, or profound as the philosophies and religions of Greece, yet he became temporal master of Greece. Step by step, therefore, the world was bound together without benefit of the gods. Now the Roman was enough of a businessman to realize something that even we do not fully recognize as we try to gather around some such place of compromise and arbitration as the United Nations uh, Council Chamber. The Roman realized that he could not profitably destroy the religions of all the peoples he conquered. He realized that to do so would be to destroy the social structure of the world. He therefore controlled the religion, but did not attempt to destroy it. And in the height of the empire, Rome, in its great edicts, declared universal religious tolerance. And at the time of the great Roman Forum, which was really the common ground of the empire. Temples to many deities of many races and of many nations stood side by side with complete immunity from persecution. The Roman did not care what you worshipped as long as you paid your taxes and kept out of treasonable activity. He did not care what your religion was as long as you did not attempt to discredit the economic, political, military, or social power of the Roman state. Therefore, nearly all religious persecution in Rome was the result of groups or individuals attacking the Roman way of life. As long as they did not do this and simply maintained their interest in their own affairs, the Romans uh, were not inclined to persecute in any way. And the proof of that is that nearly all of the great religious and philosophical teachers of the period at one time or other drifted into Rome, had schools there, and taught publicly without any interference of any kind. They taught many doctrines strange to Rome, but they paid their taxes and kept out of politics, and all went well. This, however, presented for the first time a situation that had never existed in our general thinking. The world, the Roman world, had the spectacle of many gods meeting on a common ground. The temples of many faiths, and to a certain degree, this proximity must have influenced Roman thinking. It must have caused the Roman 
and later the members of other peoples that came to Rome for one reason or another to do for the first time what you might call religious shopping. They began to look around. Instead of simply worshiping the conventional deities of Rome, they learned that a certain teacher was particularly outstanding, so they went to him. We know that because of their attitude, uh, the Roman intellectual would go to the great teacher of rhetoric regardless of his gods. That made no difference. But we can be quite certain that an outstanding master of rhetoric or philosophy addicted to other deities would certainly involve his students in his personal philosophies and religions as time went on. So we have the possibility, which did not previously exist, of the average person weighing gods against each other, trying to observe the relative values of things, and coming to the conclusion that this was deeper than that, or that was more shallow than this, and the possibility arose of the individual saying, I believe this philosophy or this theology is better than that. Previously, uh, such comparison was comparatively impossible. This arose also in the building of Roman philosophy. And when we study the works of the principal Roman philosophers, as Marcus Aurelius Antoninus, the Emperor Julianus, and uh, Cicero, and several of the other outstanding men of the time, we know that they were all eclectic philosophers. That is, they showed definitely that each one of them had trotted from one temple to another and had gained something every time he stopped. And out of this uh, religious circumambulation of the forum, he had come to a new kind of philosophy with a bit of Egyptian, a bit of Greek, a bit of Persian, and perhaps a few vestiges of old Roman lore and uh, a kindly thought for the Druids or the Mithraic uh, teachings which became the principal religion of the Roman legions. During the period of the conquest of Britain, for example, the Roman soldiers were not even worshipping the Roman gods. They were worshipping the Persian Mithraic deities. The image of Mithras slaying the ox was the principal symbol, and the Roman soldiers left it in England by a little stream, and because of this statue it was later called Oxford, and there the great university of Oxford was built, being built upon a monument or in relation to a monument of a Persian god placed there by orthodox Roman legionnaires. <laughs> now you begin to see that we are in what might be termed a polyglot situation. Rome made possible, in fact made inevitable, that discriminating persons who previously probably had never visited far from their own lands were now able within Rome itself or in Alexandria under Roman control or in Athens under Roman control or in Antioch under Roman control or Ephesus all of these great polyglot centers being then Romanized politically that they could go to these centers or living in them could enjoy extraordinary educational and cultural opportunities. That in any one of these cities a dozen great teachers might be flourishing together, uh, not as in uh, Greece, uh, divided by their arts and sciences primarily, but now divided in the total religion, philosophy, and idealism which dominated their systems. There is no doubt that without such a situation, Gnosticism, a polyglot belief, could not have come into existence. Neoplatonism could not have arisen to the condition of general recognition which it enjoyed. There would have been very little possibility of the ascent of Manichaeanism, which was another one of these polyglot beliefs nor would we probably have had hermetic philosophy. They all seem to be more or less involved in this pattern. We also find 
rising in areas under general broad Roman influence, such as uh, Judea, the rise of the Essenian cult, later the Kabbalists, and in North Africa the Jewish sect of the Therapeutae. We find men like Philo Judaeus arising in uh, this pattern for the first time writing a work on religion in terms of comparative religion in which instead of deriving his total message uh, from his own faith he immediately began to use other faiths as means of explaining his own this uh, this situation may be said to have broadly uh, existed just at the critical period that most interests us. Nor can we overlook the fact that Christianity rose at precisely the same time, and that Christianity as a structural faith bore witness within itself again of a highly complicated intellectual, moral, aesthetic background, a background in which from the very beginning Christianity stood out against, for instance, the background of Orthodox Judaism. Here we have a faith uh, emerging by a strenuous reform. Here we find this faith spreading almost like wildfire, extending through a highly conditioned society. Had Egypt, with its old gods, had its old impregnable position, had the ancient deities of Greece been firmly and completely dominant, and had the Latinized Greek gods of Rome had the strength and domination and complete authority that they had in the times of Numa, or even uh, in the period of the first Caesars, we could not have imagined any uh, polyglot or heterodox faith spreading through these areas without an immediate reaction that would have almost exterminated it. Instead of that, we find it reaching people who are already inquiring, who are already a little uncertain, who are already disillusioned in something. The great note of Judaism of the time was disillusionment. The ancient gods of Israel had not preserved their people from the tyranny of Rome, or the term of the tyranny of Herod. The old vows had been broken. The punishment of deity was upon a delinquent people. All these explanations, man's moral effort to avoid or evade the inevitable fact that as a sovereignty he had been defeated and enslaved. All this turmoil, all this increasing doubt the power of Rome took away from nearly all these other peoples the absolute faith which they previously had in their own deities and gave them no immediate transference of that faith to any other group of deities. And gradually out of this confusion appears to have, a, have ri arisen a kind of intellectual individuality perhaps best represented by your eclectic philosophy these people simply, as we said, went shopping intellectually. And they bought a little from this store and a little from that mart or shop. And they built together a philosophy. A philosophy based upon experience, justified by personal favor, and perhaps containing a beautiful assortment of partly digested inconsistencies as in the very beautiful but not maturely organized meditations of Marcus Aurelius. Now this perhaps is the answer for a rather ro long roundabout road but one that almost has to be covered uh, to the rise of the Corpus Hermeticum. It represents a natural instinct on the part of man, an instinct that we are feeling today, the instinct for the need for a substantial religious philosophy of life, an instinct that is pressed on by disillusionments. 
an instinct which is somewhat embittered, an instinct uh, which has no longer the open-minded uh, faith of the small child, but rather the disillusioned attitude of maturity. Uh, no longer this willingness, this readiness to believe all good things, but a certain suspicion, a fear that all pretenses conceal ulterior motives, or perhaps the continual fear of being hurt again, a further disillusionment involved in spiritual conviction. We know from the writings of Boethius and others that this disillusionment was strong in these early formative years of our modern religious life. If this can be regarded as valid, and we assume, as we must, that all old faiths did not die in their tracks, in other words, in these critical periods, a curtain didn't fall over the religions of the world, and all the old ways simply ceased by magic. It was reported that Great Pan died, but we have no proof that this actually happened. We only know that he was no longer to be seen playing on his pipes by the side of the river. Actually, Egyptian philosophy did not die. Greek philosophy did not die. The Druids did not die. They were perpetuated in England in the bards. They were perpetuated in all the later mythology and lore, such as the Arthurian cycle and the legend of Taliesin. All the old ways lived on, but they lived on with certain modifications and changes. And in many instances, they flowed together to form new combinations which lived, and the original patterns were no longer entirely distinguishable. We know, for example, that before the end of the 6th century, Egyptian philosophy in Egypt was virtually dead. By that time, Moslemism was beginning to come in, and in a short time the land of the pharaohs would no longer be Egypt. It would be an Arabic state in which perhaps only a few of the old Copt Christians held any real link to the past. Therefore, if Egyptian religion survived at all in Egypt, it survived in Coptic Christianity. And we have reasons to know that this is quite essentially true, for there is much evidence of the survival of Egyptian religion in the Greek Orthodox, the Russian Orthodox, and the Armenian Orthodox churches. So things disappeared into patterns and came out again much later. And because after this decline of the Roman Empire came the Dark Ages with almost complete illiteracy, a great deal that was carried across this long dark interval was born with half memory. People did not even know anymore where it came from. They had forgotten and did forget in the course of four or five hundred years the entire cycle of descent. Little by little the symbolism was moved into new patterns and imposed upon new doctrines until the original situation was comparatively forgotten. And today if you go through a great cathedral or study the various parts and elements of Christian ritualism, you will find hundreds of relics, fragments, survivals of much older pre-Christian beliefs. But the average Christian believer does not even know this. Therefore, it is quite likely that he did not know it a thousand years ago, even as well as he does not know it today. <laughs> I finally made a sentence out of that, didn't I? <laughs> anyway, out of the polyglot of Greek, Egyptian, some Syrian, possibly some Hindu, and other Asiatic faiths, we seem to find two or three important uh, groups emerge. One of these groups was most certainly the Hermetic. <coughs> 
It is also interesting to observe that the early church fathers, the anti-Nicene fathers, anti now meaning before, not against, uh, the uh, anti before the Council of Nicaea, the anti-Nicene fathers accepted out of the past two uh, so-called pagan teachers with almost universal respect. A little later they added a third. The first two that they accepted were Plato and Hermes. And the third, who became popular a little later, but retained his popularity beyond either of the others, was Aristotle. And by the rise of medieval Christianity, Aristotle was held in just about as high a regard as any of the prophets or patriarchs. Christianity became Aristotelian, whereas in the early part of it, it was essentially Platonic. But that these church fathers in the first, second, and third centuries should not have resented either Plato or Hermes is itself an interesting point. It means that they recognized in these systems certain truths or certain realities which could not be denied or which were so stated that they could be Christianized to the benefit of the new faith. What then was the uh, point, the basic point, upon which so much of this depended? And uh, apparently uh, this basic point in both cases was the definition of deity. Uh, the Gnostics had an entirely different definition of deity, so they were almost completely rejected. The Neoplatonists, with their peculiar mystical approach, also found little favor. But the Platonists and the Hermetists found a very strong favor because of their approach to deity as a purely monotheistic being. Therefore, we must say that Hermetic philosophy introduces strongly, sometime slightly before or at about the period of the Christian era, a totally monotheistic concept of God. Now this is interesting because it has been called a pantheistic monotheism. Not a polytheistic, but a pantheistic. In other words, the one deity of Hermes and of Plato was a deity within creation not a deity outside of or brooding over creation. Uh, the attitude of Hermes is the same as the attitude of St. Paul, the God in whom or in which. And we are told that probably the original of the New Testament statement was also in which we live and move and have our being. Thus the deity of Hermes was an all-enclosing spiritual principle. And this essentially is also the Logos of Plato. Thus the belief in one God seems to have endeared these two schools to the early rising Christianity and to have caused the Christian church, particularly in the period of its great apologists, same air received all offerings, and men beginning to look around observed that the offerings were usually similar. They then went on a little further and they discovered that the same number of deities were in the different sanctuaries, and that the deities of similar uh, definition had similar appearance and attributes. And we must not assume for a moment that antiquity was essentially stupid. These individuals observing these things could only come to one possible conclusion, namely that there were strong similarities, even identities, between these faiths. And after uh, all, they had had 1,200 or more years to catch up with the idea that the Egyptian pharaoh Akhenaten had already expressed, namely that there never had been but one God and that all men worshipped him under different names. The Romans, 
and other peoples under their dominion had the opportunity to see this worshipping under many names. And out of this came perhaps the idea uh, that the basic reconciliation lay in the fact that there was one basic divine principle and that this divine principle variously named and defined was the principal deity in all these pantheons. We observe men like the Emperor Julian contemplating this very thoughtfully and strengthening our belief that such could have been the case when he gave us his two great orations one to the sovereign son and the other to the mother of the gods. He tells us beyond doubt that his own contemplations have shown him the universality of a divine principle. Consequently, it is not necessary that this should have been imposed upon men, either by the Christianity or by Hermeticism. Already philosophy had acknowledged it, but in the old days when nations were separate and the commerce between them was very slight, peoples of various nations did not know the beliefs of their brothers and their neighbors. Gradually, as this knowledge improved, became more aware of these things, uh, the public mind itself inevitably produced this concept of the over-deity. The deity that did not destroy the other gods. Nor was this deity merely one becoming victorious and gaining special veneration. It was a new dimension of deity, a permeating, <coughs> penetrating, universal power, a power in which all things shared and which was the common life of all living. Thus, it would be inevitable that if this concept arose in the minds of progressive thinkers, that it would be the natural substance for the integration of sect or creed or cult or faith. It is also quite possible, as always is the case, uh, that early rising of such belief would be secret that men would gather first to mature their own ideas and to escape the eternal stigma of unorthodoxy which has followed thinkers since the beginning of time. Thus these precious discoveries, following in the pattern and practice of the older mysteries, would be uh, communicated only to an elect only to those who were regarded as capable of understanding correctly this new dimension of things. Which brings us to the next point in connection with the Hermetic philosophy, and that is its relationship to the mystery systems of the world at that time. We have mentioned the state religions. We must always remember that behind each state religion was some kind of a mystical or metaphysical structure. Antiquity did not know of a religion without mysteries. And by mysteries now we do not mean secrets in the general sense of the word, but structures, ethical, moral, spiritual institutions, sacred colleges or schools. And they were called mysteries because they were sealed or closed from the profane even as though they had been closed by some kind of an hermetic stubble. These mysteries always had a deeper dimension than the general opinions of the people. As far back as the 6th century, when Pythagoras traveled throughout the, uh, the Near East and the southern parts of Europe and finally into Far Asia, he came back fully convinced that in their esoteric schools all the great religions of the world were already teaching the same thing. The average person hadn't discovered this, however. Perhaps we can suspect that the confusion 
resulting in the collapse of the outer structure of religion of many of these peoples through a great and sudden weight upon the esoteric schools. And these esoteric schools were not essentially theological as we know it today, and therefore they were not quite as vulnerable as the so-called popular religions. These so-called esoteric schools were actually institutions of higher learning. And even though you might lose faith in your deities, you could not deny the multiplication table. You could not deny the value of herbs and medicines in healing. You could not deny the secrets of bone setting. You could not deny the motion of the heavenly bodies nor the secrets of navigation. You could no longer perhaps accept certain beliefs, but you were still leaning heavily upon jurisprudence, which was originally taught in these temples. You were leaning very heavily upon the laws and canons of art, of sculpture, and of music. All the great scientific knowledge, which was originally dedicated to the gods and was disseminated through the schools of these gods, this knowledge did not die with the popular faith. Thus uh, the uh, esoteric schools, all the mysteries, perhaps came forward more rapidly after the decline of the state religions. Men now had a new level of value upon which to pin their faith. And it is quite possible that it was at this time uh, that the gradual shift from a spiritual to a scientific way of life actually began. And as it took thousands of years to create the philosophical religious systems of the ancients, the last 2,000 years has been largely dedicated to the shift from the theological foundation of exoteric religion to the great mystery sciences of esoteric religion. In any event, uh, the learned, the leading minds, those who became the opinion makers of their own days, uh, certainly must have recognized that you could not destroy uh, the school with the temple, that the school had to go on, that man still had to learn. The increasing dignity of the school is, is expressed in Neoplatonism, Gnosticism, and Hermetic philosophy, and to a degree in the Essene and Therapeutae doctrine, certainly in the Kabbalism of the early uh, Jewish mystics rising from Rabbi Akiba, who belongs to this same critical period and is just about as difficult to orient as any of the others. Uh, all of this seems to show that the universe began to emerge as a great wonder of law. We no longer hear of the gods walking around the earth concealed as mortals or riding away into heaven in chariots. We no longer see winged immortals flying in space. We hear no more of nymphs and hamadryads. These things vanish. Instead of that, we begin to hear of the teachers, the great illuminators, those who came with extraordinary knowledge, those who made possible the advancement of arts and sciences, and those who gradually transformed the beliefs of men into a kind of moral philosophy or ethical system, a system based almost entirely upon the philosophic premise of adjustment to disillusionment. Philosophy is actually man's reconciliation with the inevitable. And in that we see it emerging. We see it coming more and more into the foreground. And we find men like Hermes or beings like Hermes no longer simply telling stories and fables about the gods or writing hymns about deities or perpetuating the powers of arbitrary deities. We find Hermes and these others beginning to talk about structure, 
about the universal law of living. And we know that out of the North African Hermetic tradition, almost certainly the astronomical theory of Ptolemy came into existence. The theory that controlled the thinking of men until the day of the Copernican rediscovery of the old heliocentric idea. We find law, lawfulness, education, culture, coming forward very rapidly, apparently from nowhere, and spearheaded by mysterious phantom-like persons. Let's pause for a moment and uh, consider uh, for the Neoplatonism, which was in the same general area. It is now generally believed that Neoplatonism was founded by a man called Ammonius Sarkis. Ammonius Sarkis was a sort of North African Aesop. He was a strange man uh, of no education as far as is known, and his name implies his trade. He was a carrier of bundles, burdens, and trunks. He was Ammonius of the sack, and he delivered goods for people and received a small amount of money for transporting and transferring uh, freight and baggage. He was sometimes referred to as a porter, certainly as a carrier of burdens. This man is supposed to have suddenly burst out with one of the most transcendent systems of mysticism the world has ever known. How he received it, where it came from, no one has been able to say. Yet this man, unlettered, unschooled, unlearned, drew around himself one of the most brilliant academy of thinkers that the world has ever known, including such minds as Plotinus, Iamblichus, and other leading thinkers of his day, finally to produce in Athens a little later the glorious glittering figure of Proclus, who is called or surnamed the Platonic successor. Uh, the rise of Neoplatonism is a mystery and has always remained a mystery. Yet there is a dark hint that behind Ammonius Sarkis was another person. That for some reason this other person chose to be represented by the common bearer of burdens. Now who is this bearer of burdens? Perhaps it is the same bearer of which there is reference in the Bible of cast your burdens upon the Lord. Also there are many uh, concepts of Jesus as bearing the burden of the world's woe or bearing the burden of mortal sin. This burden bearer keeps appearing in many localities, certainly a possible symbolic statement or concept. But who and uh, what uh, was the, uh, the force behind this. It is quite possible that these persons simply represented teachers or initiated masters sent out of the schools or of the mystery system or stepping in because of their superior knowledge into the vacuum left by the collapse of popular theology and moving the entire concept onto a new level. It could well be that under such a situation, this breaking through could have occurred in many places at almost the same time because the need was general. And the need in this case produced an almost perfectly structured breakthrough in a dozen places simultaneously. We may assume that these were inspirational, but we may also assume that the temples were the source of the inspiration for they had been for a very long time. Furthermore, as soon as this breakthrough occurred, as soon as the world in general began to think scientifically, philosophically, cosmologically, and to begin to use the instrument of symbolism with a certain intuitive apperception, the moment this breakthrough took place, the mystery schools vanished. And from that time in the Western world we heard no more of them, 
until a very much later date, hundreds of years later, when we find the rising of Christian mysticism in Europe. But probably a thousand years passed, and the great institutions of Elysis and Samothrace, the ritualistic temples of Memphis and Luxor, Karnak, the great temples of Egypt, particularly Memphis of the White Walls, all these disappeared. We find, for example, that with the rise of Christian mysticism in Syria, the Essenes disappeared, and no one has the slightest knowledge of what happened to them. <coughs> they vanished. The moment the breakthrough took place, the old schools that had been the custodians of the lore and had only accepted candidates under oath and obligation, the schools vanished. The uh, one possible solution to this is that once the arcana, or the secret of the schools, the knowledge which they had so long religiously guarded, became public, their own existence ceased. Because you cannot maintain a secret that is out, nor can you initiate people to gain a special knowledge which they can gain without it. Uh, this, the levels that these schools represented then moved into society to become an objective recognized system. In, <coughs> in the hundreds of years that followed we have the building upon these foundations because this revelation of laws was a pretty tremendous thing and it brought out foundations that could not be immediately uh, exhausted nor fully built upon. It has taken centuries to build upon these foundations even as far as we have today. And without the knowledge of the Greeks and Egyptians of 2,500 years ago, modern man would never have advanced his knowledge of electronic or atomic energy because he is actually making his calculations with the instruments that were given to him by the Greeks, Egyptians, and Arabs. Thus, from the emerging of these things, we begin to see why out of the ruin of a theology which had failed due to the wars that had destroyed men's faith in the ancient gods, there arose a new object or a new instrument of faith, faith in wisdom, faith in essential value. And this wisdom gradually became synonymous with God. Deity was no longer the Olympian despot. Deity was now the extraordinarily wise father, the old learned one. Deity was moving gradually into the relationship of the mentor, of the great teacher. And in the uh, speculations upon this subject, it was not difficult to imagine that this universal mind this power that was behind the whole great institution of learning should suddenly blaze forth as the most convincing concept of deity that there was. So God became no longer a symbol of power, but a symbol of wisdom. This was something that actually the Greeks did not have. The Greeks had deity as an object of veneration, and in the Mithraic hymns, and not Mithraic, the Orphic hymns, we find a great adoration for deity. But the Olympian gods were a rather frivolous lot as a whole. Uh, they had some other strange and inconsistent practices and were not entirely admirable, as even Socrates pointed out. There were some scandals among the immortals that were better not mentioned even by the Greeks. <laughs> Some of these scandals, rather well whitewashed, have descended to us in Bullfinch's mythology of the Greeks and Romans. Whatever scandals, however, were whitewashed by the Greeks were revealed in their full splendor by the Romans. And it was not uh, the state religion. It was the great school of philosophers rebelling against it not rebelling against the gods, but rebelling against the literal acceptance of, of doctrines which they held to have mystical or secret meaning that made possible the rise of Pythagoras and Plato. Because it was the duty of these men 
to refine and improve and deepen and broaden the concept of religion. That men should realize that these fables were actually stories of secrets and wonders that could only be fully understood by those who had been initiated into the sacred colleges and rites. And that then in these schools the keys were given by means of which these fables were unlocked in all their internal splendor. A man could begin to appreciate the greatness of the things which he had once regarded as frivolous. This, re this remedying of an obvious defect resulting from man outgrowing his own infancy, uh, the uh, great philosophers uh, strenuously attempted to achieve, and they did to a great degree. Gradually the world caught up with them, and these philosophical systems that were once for the few became increasingly significant to the many. Now this tremendous rise of intellectual rebellion against limitation brought also with it a certain inevitable reaction. You know, we find, for instance, a very interesting thing that as soon as the public mind began to be highly philosophy conscious, the philosophers gradually became mystics. The leaders departed from this pattern also and began to emphasize a purely theistic, intuitive approach to deity. It seemed as though they instinctively realized that intellectualism would run the whole thing into the ground, finally that men substituting mind for God were going to fall out of the horns of another dilemma. They were going to gradually grow great with pride. They were going to worship their own thoughts. And they were going to adore the products of their own mind. And they were going to lose the basic intuitive power which comes only from humility. Thus, even at the beginning, you see the struggle taking form that was finally to emerge, the philosophizing and the revelation of certain great secrets from the temples could no longer be stopped. The breaking down of the mystery institutions, the final dispersing of the priesthoods, the conquering of the areas, the, the pillaging of the great sanctuaries, scattering their teachers, meant only the inevitable need for the preservation of ideas and the only way to preserve them was to throw them into the very public mind from which they had once been protected because only then could the common man be the keeper of the mystery otherwise it would have died with that generation but no sooner had this occurred than it became obvious that a great danger was also presenting itself and this probably was the one great surviving preserving factor that threw a number of these early important leaders into the Christian camp. Here was an important control or directive against the rising of the wisdom principle to the point of mental arrogance. Here was humility. Here was a simple doctrine of human relationships. Here was a simple teaching of the brotherhood of man and the fatherhood of God and do good. Serve, love, have faith, and practice the virtues. This coming into conflict with the revelation of exact knowledge seemingly occurs in pattern in the mingling of the wisdom of the old mystery systems with the emotional mystical content which was so present in human nature and these mingling produced the heresies they produced the conflicts which mutilated the first six centuries of the Christian era here then we had the beginning of the schismatic difficulties we had the wisdom principle and the love or emotion principle drawing apart, trying to build a bridge, each attempting to absorb the other, each determined to preserve itself against absorption. 
and finally in many instances parting as foes and each going its own way deprived of the most valuable of all factors that which would have been reconciliation the bringing of these things together so that we could have had an enlightened love and we could have had a truly spiritualized human idealized wisdom the dividing of these two groups has never been completely overcome but the mind being by nature a dominant and inquisitive instrument has continued to dominate and has continued to lead man into intellectual intellectual segregation ever since that time until today mind dominates practically every attitude and action of the human being our medic problem then seems to deal with the breakthrough in North Africa of certain secret instructions we know that the priests of Amun Ra those who wrote the rituals of the dead those who gave the ancient Egyptian Amunism and later the Osirian religious cult those who swung their censers before the altars of the great old gods these priests with their chants their rituals their rites and their ceremonies were not the builders of the pyramid the builders of the pyramid were mathematicians masters of geometry deeply versed in astronomy possessors of exact sciences these exact sciences therefore moved behind the surface of Egyptian religion and Dr. Preston pointed out that he was he told me one day that he was uh, convinced that the Egyptian hieroglyphics have at least two different methods of being read one being a sacerdotal language a language of priestly process and the other in some way related to the mystery systems dr. Preston was convinced that behind the surface of Egyptian religion was this great wisdom cult the cult that produced Imhotep the father of medicine the cult which made possible the building of these great monuments and also the gradual regulation of the laws of Egypt until Egypt became probably one of the most magnificently integrated cultures in the history of antiquity these things were practical achievements achievements that could only have arisen from adequate knowledge the people did not possess that knowledge the Egyptian lived and died without it uh, the uh, ruler the rulers of Egypt although initiated into the priesthood did not always possess it actually it was held by a group an organization a secret body of persons and this secret body perpetuated itself by rites and ceremonies as described by Plutarch in his mysteries of Isis and Osiris this breaking through in Egypt seems to have given us the basic principles of Hermetic philosophy because these principles deal with certain things the true nature of deity the true nature of deity here interpreted as the eternal mind which brings all things into existence by the power of thought thus Thoth, thought Hermes Mercury gives us the concept of a world that exists in the divine mind a projection and manifestation of the eternal thinker and he tells us that the world is the non-eternal thought of that eternal thinker that all things are supported on the warp and woof of thought thought thoth for our word thought comes from his name this being therefore which is the creating power creates by will creates by the exercise of secret attributes this deity is not a highly glorified Louis the 16th this deity is not the Zeus of ancient 
Greece, nor the Jupiter of the Latins. This is a mystery God, a God without form, of which all things are the form, a God without dimensions or proportions, but containing all dimensions and proportions within its own nature, a God of seven powers, which are seven arts and sciences, and a God ruling by the inevitable motion of its own being, and this motion absolute law. When we begin to see this, we begin to see that we are escaping from most of the type of thinking that wrecked antiquity. We are moving forward into something, and we do not know how it was concealed as long as it was, but that it appeared spontaneously in many areas, and that it is intimated by men like Pythagoras and Plato, who were initiates, to have existed, intimated by Apuleius and Plutarch, to have existed, referred to arcanely by Cicero and Seneca, known to the Emperor Julian as the result of his own initiation at Ephesus, and appearing again in the apocalyptical writings of the New Testament. These factors breaking through seem to tell us, beyond any reasonable doubt, that this structure of the Corpus Hermeticum was the beginning of, or one of the beginnings, of the effort to build a complete scientific philosophical foundation under the collapsing religions of antiquity. That this information had been previously perfected, and that the outstanding examples of this perfection would be found in the great architectural and legal documents of antiquity, such as the Code of Hammurabi, probably the earliest and one of the most enlightened of all um, legal codes, that it is to be found concealed in various ways in the proportions and dimensions of ancient buildings, that it roots in mathematics, that it roots in subjects so ancient that we cannot even trace their beginnings, that there was also a consistent integrated concept of the solar system, of the universe, of space, of time, of energy, and all of these things, which certainly form no part of the decadent ceremonials of the old later Roman priesthood, whose principal concerns was to, were to be sure that they had the right cap on and that they were wearing the red slippers without which they could not perform their sacred duties. And when asked why they wore the red slippers, the answer seemed to be because their forefathers had sacrificed animals and stood with their feet in the blood. These things became a kind of orthodoxy, but behind it all this was this other, greater thing. And when Julius Caesar sacrificed to the gods as em emperor deity, he certainly did not know these other things, or he would not have conducted his life in the way that he did. So this double body of learning came out. And we find it striking in Syria through the Syrian Gnosis and in Alexandria through the Alexandrian Gnosis, through the Corpus Hermeticum, through the Neoplatonists, and through the rise of Christianity and the impact of Essenian and Therapeutae thinking in North Africa. All of this body of material arising almost at the same time, all with the same basic dimension of released thinking, and also, for the first time, polarized thinking. You'll remember that when uh, medicine was still in the sanctuary and was serviced by priest physicians, uh, that there were no legislations in Rome for the deportment of a doctor. The moment, however, medicine left the temple and physicians became secular, it was necessary within ten years to create one of the most elaborate legal systems in the world to prevent medical malpractice. The moment the sacredness of the thing was removed, the moment there was the secular physician, there was the need for medical reform almost within the day. The same thing happened in this intellectual field. The moment the knowledge of the power, potential, and possibility of the human mind was equipped with the instruments of knowledge, instruments which Cicero and Seneca also mentioned, 
immediately. It was necessary to create legislation, real or theoretical, to prevent the abuse of knowledge. And from that time on today, we are still trying to find out how to prevent that abuse, and we have not by any means succeeded. Against this abuse, we have thrown a great moral framework. And today, even in our present emergency, we are using religion to combat the destructiveness of materialistic scientific thinking. And by an instinct, without any actual integration, without anyone being able as a person to require it or demand it, the age of atomics has resulted in the greatest age of religious revival the world has had in at least a thousand years. So back in the first century, the rise of a great scientific concept of life threw immediately into perspective the need for this great religious reform. So the scientific phase of it, the philosophical phase of it, and Christianity as the religious phase of it all came into existence together. Each part of a need, each essential to an orientation. Now what was the actual wisdom orientation of that time? Were the individuals involved in that revelation actually as wise as some think they were, or as foolish as some others think they were? Can we honestly say today, looking back upon the first century, that those people knew anything that we do not know. I think we can be almost forced to answer in the affirmative that they did. Because actually, in order to exhaust what they knew, we have to exhaust something which we have not yet exhausted. And that is the instrument by means of which we are capable of creative knowing. It is one thing to copy the past, which we have done. It is one thing to take a Roman sewer pipe and make a better one today. It is one thing to take an Egyptian lute and make a more perfect instrument of it. It is one thing to take a Syrian trumpet and make a, a peculiar uh, hook in it or twist it and form it into what we call a trombone. That is all within the possibility of things. Actually, our French horn has not changed much in the last 2,000 years. It is quite possible to take a piece of Coptic or Greek fabric and create new ways of weaving it. It is possible to use the Greek mathematical theory and find constant applications for it. But these do not represent the basic point. Sometimes, somewhere, someone created geometry. This creation consisted not of bringing something out of nothing, but of a peculiar type of trained intuitive observationalism by means of which a human being suddenly recognized the universe as a geometric manifestation of universal energy. This individual had the power to see geometry in nature, or sense it, or begin to organize it. Somebody else saw for the first time the analogies between music and number. Another individual saw somewhere, somehow, the basic principle of chemistry and the chemical combinations of elements. Somewhere there were basic thoughts. The basic thought of the 47th proposition of Pythagoras or the Euclidean proposition. Study your ancient contributions in astronomy, geometry, music, rhetoric, grammar. Somewhere these things had perhaps not a fully developed emergence but a series of creative impulses by which that appeared which was not previously available. We have not exhausted antiquity until we have reached a point 
where we can create knowledge rather than merely extend existing knowledge. When the individual of today can create something as absolutely independent as arithmetic, he may then say that he has a creative power to exhaust and has exhausted the previous contributions of his people. But as long as he merely uses arithmetic, he has lacked that tremendous creativity which is the basis of the wisdom of antiquity, the power to be the first to know something. Now we may say that everything worth knowing has already been found so we can't do it. This is untrue. There are more firsts waiting than have ever yet been revealed. But as long as we are content to use rather than to create, we have lost one dimension of thinking. And that dimension is the very thing that the Hermetic Doctrine is concerned with, namely man's ability to become conscious within and of the universal mind itself, so that every individual <coughs> creates with the mind of God, or with the universal divine intellect. Thus, the end of all knowing, according to the Hermetic system, is that men will not think about God or think of God, but think with God. And this statement still poses one of the most difficult situations with which the average individual can intellectually be confronted, because we cannot even understand fully what this implication actually is. But we do know that at a time less blessed than our own, when the opportunities for knowledge were much less than ours, when the instruments of available learning were far more deficient than ours, men had the creativity which established all of our great instruments of knowledge. Therefore, that this creativity lay within consciousness itself was not acquired but was innate, and that the solution to all things lies in the innate solutional power of the universal mind in man. Now that someone two thousand years ago should have sounded this is important, and it is easy to see why this idea could not die, why it had to continue to exercise an influence, and it is also possible to estimate from this why this orientation uh, could have been involved in the Corpus Hermeticum. The idea of this one consciousness, the author of all knowledge, this one mind, the substance of all good, and of course with it all, the vision of the way in which man through the development of the special and particular faculties of his own consciousness, might in some way and in due time attain to identity with this mind. We will learn a little later that such is the burden of the, uh, the divine Parmanda, or the shepherd of men. And we know that it is the burden of that department of the Neoplatonic thinking which is called the theurgical part, namely the urge, the magic of fulfillment, the magic of doing, the magic not of listening nor learning, but the strange power to be one with truth. So back even in that day, men dreamed of the possibility of bringing their own consciousness in rapport with the universal consciousness. And the secret books of Hermes and the mysteries of the Hermetic doctrine were in one way or another concealed in this or were concerned with it. Thus, the moment we apply this key to alchemy, we change the entire pers perspective of these chemists. The transmutation of ignorance, the transmutation of not knowing into the state of pure enlightenment. Uh, the creation of the universal medicine, truth itself, which alone can heal all the sickness of ignorance wherever it is distributed. And the principal primary contribution of the Hermetic philosophy was that such a truth elixir 
was possible. That it was not the vain speculation of deluded persons. That it was not a hope beyond possibility. But that truth substantially was attainable. Perhaps not immediately. Perhaps not totally. But that the motion toward truth was the motion toward solution of every problem, internal and external, as far as problem could beset man or any of his attributes. Thus, the, uh, the hermetic arts consisted of the arts of human regeneration. There is everything to indicate that they were influenced by Buddhism. Buddhism with its noble path of renunciation. It is quite possible that, it, that uh, the Hermetic philosophy was influenced by the earlier systems of Eastern mysticism that resulted in Yoga and Vedanta. It is quite possible and almost certain that this system was also influenced by the in part of the old Sanhedrin, the great Sanhedrin of the Jews, which dealt with the mystery of the Merkava or the chariot of righteousness by means of which the prophet is transported to heaven without death. This chariot of righteousness, this chariot of Ezekiel, being the symbol of illumination or the spiritual ecstasy by which man is moved from one world to another. Hermes himself describes this experience or the writer of the Hermetic doctrine creates a person and causes that person to be the personification of the truth seeker receiving into himself the experience peculiar to those who through dedication have become worthy of the truth. Thus in the Pamanda and in other hermetic fragments universal mind or consciousness becomes the teacher instructing the disciple in the attainment of the great end of learning which is the hermetic marriage or the hermetic union, the union of the mortal and the immortal in an indissolvable bond of amity. In these thinkings then we have the grounds for many mystical speculations that were to come at later date. We see the source of a large part of Christian mysticism. We begin to see why the more illumined church fathers must have recognized the same essential doctrine that they themselves were seeking to cultivate. They must also have realized that the experience of deity is the end of all spiritual quest. And because Hermeticism, uh, like the early church, was concerned with truth as an experience of consciousness, it could not be rejected totally any more than the ethical experience of Plato could be rejected totally. So the orientation of our problem is historically in these centuries of change, these centuries by which certain directives arose in the thinking of man, and in the midst of these directives we see the rise of this very strange and elusive belief. A belief, however, which again never died, but became disseminated through a hundred sects, even reaching into the Near East to become very important in the teachings of the dervishes and the Sufis. Thus this teaching moved in and on through time, losing its name after a very short time, but never losing its directive to the individual or its positive affirmation of the exact science of human illumination, illumination or redemption through the spiritual experience of illumination. These elements and these factors give us the orientation and will, I think, permit us to go on next week with a further analysis of the doctrine itself.